Hello, I'm James Holland and I'm a historian of the Second World War. History Hit is a bit like Netflix, but purely for history. And we've got hundreds of hours of historical documentaries going all the way back to classical times, right through to the Cold War and beyond. Use the word war stories, all one word, for a massive discount when you join up. A war of numbers. Men, ammunition, guns, ships, aircraft. Quantity is the difference between victory and defeat. And for the first time in history, everything is recorded in exacting detail. A billion artillery shells, a million machine guns, 50 billion bullets. 65 million men at war who die at a rate of 6,000 a day. A war of numbers, fought by calculating generals for whom no cost is too high. In 1916, the Imperial Great War is killing men in appalling numbers. British casualties, killed, wounded and missing, amount to 650,000. French losses total almost 900,000. Germany's over 1 million. And Russia's a shocking 2.5 million. In 1917, many ordinary men will say no more. But hundreds of thousands will die in the nightmare that will become known as Total War. Nineteen sixteen has left the German army devastated. A third of a million casualties on the Eastern Front, 350,000 at Verdun, 600,000 more on the Somme. The German army and the country itself cannot endure another year like it. The Germans were well aware of the risks of being engaged in another battle that was similar to the Somme in 1917. Indeed, the British and the French even proposed fighting two Sommes simultaneously to wear the Germans down. Had this occurred, German economists predicted that the German economy would simply collapse for want of materials sometime in the autumn of 1917 and therefore force Germany to surrender. Germany needs a new plan a different way of fighting the war. The men who come up with that plan are Army Commander Paul von Hindenburg and his deputy, Erich Ludendorff. These two men have done very, very well on the Eastern Front, and they bring with them the ideas of new tactics, new methods of fighting the war, but also of putting Germany's industry on another step up from production to ensure that German soldiers have the means to win the war as quickly as possible, because they both realize that a long war is going to be a disaster for Germany. These two promise a quick victory offering desperate Germans hope of an end to the war. Hindenburg was an even more popular figure than the Kaiser, and Hindenburg milks this shamelessly, and he goes around posing for pictures like a war hero. And furthermore, he can also trace his ancestry all the way back to the Teutonic Knights, so he desperately tries to build himself up as this really culturally and nationally essential figure. Eric Ludendorff is from less refined stock. He would like to be that great Prussian aristocrat, the great Teutonic knight of old. Actually, he's not. He's effectively nouveau riche, but he takes on the mantle of this great commander, and he's very, very, very effective. In this relationship, it is the commoner who is the brains. Hindenburg and Ludendorff worked together in a, a very strange way, insofar as the thinker, the planner, the, the person that brings around strategy is actually Ludendorff. But Hindenburg is, is a front man. Their biggest problem is industrial. British and French munition factories are far out producing Germany. 
So the Germans set new manufacturing targets. Twice as many shells, three times as many machine guns, three times as many heavy guns and howitzers. But how are these targets to be achieved? They draw up a plan to conscript those who are too young or too old to fight to make munitions. Hindenburg demands the whole German nation must live only to serve the fatherland. Anybody over the age of 16 and women in supposedly useless occupations were forced into industrial production. People were forced to work 15-hour days. But despite all that, there simply weren't enough people to produce the munitions that were needed. Ludendorff reckons he needs three million more workers. In this total war, Germany turns to slave labor, drawn from its occupied territories. Since 1915, Germany has imposed Oberost, a policy of military rule over three million people in the East. Ludendorff brings in an idea of forced labor, and it really is a precursor of not exactly the concentration camps, but the forced labor that we see under Nazi Germany. It is very, very harsh. They ran Oberost with an iron fist and they plundered the country for food and fodder and forced labor. Germany's barbarous methods are not restricted to the Eastern Front. In occupied Belgium and France, prisoners of war and locals are used as slaves to build railways, roads and defenses. Others are deported to work in German factories. This is a materiel schlacht, a war of materiel, and the army with the most material will win the war, and if that means people suffering, well, the German war machine doesn't care. 180,000 Belgian men are forced into slave labor to work on military supply lines and in German factories. Conditions in forced labor camps are atrocious. The number of Belgians who die, mostly from starvation, reaches seven and a half thousand. When they are liberated, some men weigh as little as 35 kilograms. But even so, the German high command struggles to supply and defend its long front line. So Ludendorff decides to change his front, make it shorter, stronger, and closer to home. This will be the famous Hindenburg Line. Germany secretly builds a series of formidable defenses, 30 miles shorter than its current front. A new, seemingly impregnable defensive system. The Hindenburg Line was a series of five fortified zones stretching from the North Sea down to Verdun. It was organized in depth, one trench line following behind the other. They incorporated every single tactical advantage the Germans could find, from concrete blocks to intercept tanks to enormous belts of barbed wire, hidden machine gun nests in concrete bunkers, artillery positions that could bring down counter-battery fire onto any British guns that came into range, not to mention an enormous series of underground dugouts, tunnels and wireless operating stations to ensure the front was always in communication with its commanders. Building such a massive fortification is a colossal undertaking. To transport the raw materials requires 1,250 trains and 450 barges. It takes more than four months and 65,000 workers, slave laborers, Russian prisoners of war and others. 12,500 tons of barbed wire, 100,000 tons of cement, and half a million tons of rocks and gravel. The German army's retreat to its new defensive line is called Operation Alberich, and it is an act of total savagery. During Operation Alberich, the German army conducted a policy of scorched earth. This had precedence. They used a similar technique on the Eastern Front in the early years of the war. On the Western Front, roads and railways were destroyed, houses and villages were razed to the ground, 
wells were poisoned, and anything that was left standing was booby-trapped. For the local inhabitants, Operation Alberich was an act of sheer terror. The French civilians who had been living in the ground between the old German front line and the Hindenburg line were evicted by force. They had no choice in this matter. They were removed and taken into German-held territory, and their property was simply destroyed. By April 1917, the formidable Hindenburg line is built. The German economy is under total state control. And German generals are resorting to the most brutal and inhuman methods of fighting a war. The question is, will it work? April 1917. The German defences along the Hindenburg Line are about to be tested. The French commander, Robert Nivelle, has a new plan to end the war and liberate France. Nivelle's plan would become known as the Nivelle Offensive, a plan for a massive battle of rupture to be fought on the Chemin des Armes and the River Aisne. It was an assault that he believed would crack the German line in 48 hours and precipitate a general advance, liberating France by the summer of 1917. Despite heavy losses at Verdun, Nivelle was thought to have commanded well. Nivelle is buoyed up by his success at Verdun, and he promises that he can win the war virtually in a few days. And he's saying, with the right preparation, with the right number of troops, he can actually break through the German defences and get revenge for Verdun. For the first time, here was a general who claimed to have a plan that could win the war, not merely in a matter of months, but in a matter of 48 hours and he was charismatic enough to convince powerful people that he was correct. To capture the ridge at Chemin des Dames, Nivelle amasses over a million men, 5,000 guns and 200 tanks. The British will launch a simultaneous attack to distract the Germans and capture high ground. 25 divisions of the British Army, armed with 3,000 artillery guns, will hit German defences near the French city of Arras. Once through the German lines, they will join the French breakthrough and chase the enemy across Belgium back to the German border, liberating France. Despite years of similar false promises and terrible losses, French troops pin their hopes on Nivelle and his bold new plan. Soldiers in the frontline trenches were encouraged by the promise that the war was soon to end with victory. But many of Nivelle's fellow officers expressed doubts that his methods were far too ambitious and could not possibly end the war, only result instead in a vast number of casualties. April the 9th, 1917. The British attack first. Field Marshal Haig orders an artillery barrage of two and a half million shells. Three quarters of a million more than the opening bombardment of the Somme. What's more, by 1917, British shells are more advanced. You have an increase in quality control. You have the Ministry of Munitions on Whitehall that is overseeing the national production of shells and munitions. But there's also a technological innovation, the 106 Gray's Fuse, also known as the Daisy Cutter. This fuse did exactly what the name implies. Rather than detonating on a timer, it would detonate the moment it struck a strand of barbed wire, vaporizing the barbed wire far more effectively than the old shrapnel shells or the old timed shells of 1916. A key objective for the British is the high ground at Vimy Ridge. Whoever held Vimy Ridge held a critical observation advantage in all four compass points. The troops allocated the difficult task of capturing Vimy Ridge with the Canadian Corps, chosen specifically because they had established a well-earned reputation in 1916 as crack assault troops, some of the best shock troops that the British Army possessed at this stage of the First World War. For a week, 980 British guns rained one million shells down upon German lines at Vimy Ridge. Then 15,000 Canadian soldiers are ordered to advance. As they do, 
Britain's big guns keep firing. This barrage is meant to clear a path and to defend the advancing troops. The Canadians are advancing behind what's known as a creeping barrage, essentially a wall of fire and shells. They have to hug the barrage, as it's known. They have to walk as close behind it as possible. Hugging the creeping barrage is an incredibly risky business. Not only are you subject to potential drop shorts, so essentially shells that aren't in line with others, that act as a form of friendly fire, you've also got to keep within about 15 or 20 yards from the barrage itself. So this is incredibly dangerous work. At Vimy Ridge, the creeping barrage proves its effectiveness. The German frontline defences are overwhelmed by this combination of intense fire and resolute shock troops. The Canadians storm to a famous victory. Canadian Brigadier General A.E. Ross will proudly say, in those few minutes, I witnessed the birth of a nation. It's the first major Allied success on the Western Front in 18 months of fighting. But capturing Vimy Ridge comes at a horrendous cost in lives. Of the four Canadian divisions who attack, 7,000 are injured and 3,500 killed. To the generals, the Battle of Arras is a great success but the common soldiers call it the blood tub. Every day, the cost in lives is greater than it was at the Somme. There, British casualties were approaching 3,000 a day. At Arras, they are over 4,000. The heavily fortified Hindenburg line will be the scene of terrible slaughter. German defences are in greater depth, and what they're able to do is effectively let our forces advance and then hammer them with artillery and counterattack. But Arras is meant to be just a diversion. The main assault is planned 80 miles south on the Chemin des Dames, where French commander Robert Nivelle now orders his troops to advance. Nivelle is incredibly confident. In fact, he's overconfident. He thinks that he can achieve victory in just 48 hours. He expects the French to go eight kilometers in just nine hours. But Nivelle is not expecting anything as heavily fortified and massively defended as the Hindenburg line. Nivelle is operating under a massive disadvantage. What he doesn't know is that the Germans have now fortified and reinforced the area. They're waiting for him. French artillery fires an incredible five million shells, but they have little impact. The Germans have taken shelter deep underground. There, they wait for the advancing French troops who are cut down in shocking numbers by a devastating hail of bullets. The Germans have an astonishing amount of firepower. It's said that they have a machine gun every 10 meters. They're gonna mow down the French. On the first day of the assault, French losses total 40,000. Nivelle had promised there would be at most 10,000 casualties. Instead, the French lose more than 10,000 a day for 18 days and the Hindenburg line holds firm. French troops call Nivelle a mass murderer. On the 15th of May, he is sacked. But that's not enough to appease ordinary French soldiers. They're being sent to their slaughter like animals. War is taking their homes, tearing apart their families, and now they've had enough. Mutiny is in the air. May 1917. Following the disastrous Nivelle Offensive, ordinary French soldiers have had enough. The impact of the Nivelle Offensive on the morale of French troops was devastating. When their new general promised them a victory, they believed him. And when that victory did not materialize, they were discouraged, despondent, and indeed mutinous. Discontent is growing. 
A new atmosphere of rebelliousness spreads through the army. One of the ways that soldiers cope with the conditions on the Western Front was humour, and whether it was jokes or satirical magazines or songs, they all worked. The British Army produced the Wipers Times starting in 1915, and it was full of dark humour. The French had La Vie Parisienne, the Parisian life. It's full of satirical songs. Um, this one here, uh, poking fun at the Germans, of course. But sometimes humour wasn't enough of its own. And in the aftermath of the failed offensive on the Chemin de Dame, a song was written which had the lines, we've had it for good with this awful war. And the French soldiers really meant it. Soon, thousands of French troops are defiantly singing this anti-war song. The government offers a reward of a million francs and an honorable discharge to anyone who snitches on the soldier who wrote it. But no one grasses. Instead, French soldiers turn against their officers. It begins in April with what commanders somewhat euphemistically call collective acts of indiscipline. What we start finding is units going into the line start passing their senior officers bleating like sheep. They are lambs to the slaughter, and it simply gets worse from there. French troops are refusing to go over the top in tens of thousands. Almost half the French army mutinies, 68 divisions. 40,000 troops refuse to fight. 554 are court-martialed and condemned to death. But officers fear the rebellion will get ugly, so only 26 men are executed. The French commanders realize they face a possible revolution. This mutinous behavior isn't just rooted in an unwillingness to go over the top. Actually, it's also a social movement. French soldiers are looking at injustices being carried out against them. They want improved living conditions for their families. They want better help for bereaved families. This is not just a military mutiny. This is a mutiny against society and the way it's organized. Commander Robert Nivelle is replaced by the more cautious Philippe Pétain. He persuades his political masters to postpone any further military action and tries to appease the troops. Pétain has to be very careful about how he now deals with a very brittle French army. He improves the rations. The amount of leave goes up. The French army responds, but the great fear is that although the French army is getting better, it's been tainted by revolutionary spirit because actually on the Western Front, there were Russian soldiers serving alongside the French, and they begin to mutiny for real. On the Western Front, the French high command has managed to avert a revolution. But in the East, it's too late for the Russian Tsar to escape the wrath of the people. Russians have had enough of war and their noble masters. There is no sense of patriotism among ordinary Russian conscripts. We see a significant number of attempts to self-harm and to avoid the draft, and we see significant draft riots in various parts of the empire as soldiers are called up to arms. By 1917, Russian losses are shocking. Of 12 million men conscripted, almost two million are dead. A further two and a half million have been captured or else have deserted. Five million have been maimed or wounded. Less than a quarter of the Russian army is left standing. War has decimated the Russian peasantry, but it has also armed them. By the beginning of 1917, Nicholas II's personal position is profoundly vulnerable. He took over personal control of the army in 1915, so he was personally associated with the successes, or in the case of the Russian army, the failures of the prosecution of the war. Back in Russia, after centuries of groveling civility, ordinary people are daring to challenge the authority of the ruling aristocratic elite. Food is running out. 
Since the start of the war, the price of bread has increased 400%. In theory, during the First World War, the Russian Empire was very well equipped to feed itself and its colossal army. In practice, however, the state struggled with the challenge of feeding the army and maintaining a decent supply network for the country as a whole. In February 1917, 150,000 factory workers in Petrograd, many of them soldiers' wives, have had enough. Not only do they go on strike, they also riot. 1917 offers the opportunity for soldiers' wives to say, well, we're part of this great Russian national war effort. We are an important part of this, but the state must listen to us. But the imperial state is not listening. A quarter of a million workers join the women's protest. The government orders the strike and the riots be put down by force. Soldiers are sent in to quell the rebellion, but when they arrive, they refuse to fire on their own people. Up to 80,000 troops mutiny. On March the 2nd, the Tsar is on a train to the capital, Petrograd, but he's stopped by members of the Russian parliament who demand his abdication. The shocked Tsar hands the crown to his brother, who wisely turns down the job. Four centuries of Tsarist rule has come to a sudden end. A provisional government is formed, one that offers peace to Germany on condition that Germany returns all the territory it has occupied. Germany refuses. Instead, the Germans set out to kick their greatest threat in the East out of the conflict and into chaos. And they know just the man to do it. A left-wing agitator, Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, living in exile in Switzerland. Lenin was the leader of the only socialist party which promoted a defeatist position about the war. That is, he would be quite happy for Russia to lose the war. And this was something which was really welcomed by Imperial Germany. So they were very keen to encourage Lenin to get back to Russia and to continue to sow his message. He traveled back to Russia on a sealed train which was authorized by the Imperial German government. The Imperial German state bankrolls Lenin 40 million marks to support his Bolshevik coup and help him set up a propaganda paper called Pravda. A provisional Russian government has already replaced the Tsar, declared a republic and promised elections. But before these can take place, Lenin and a small force of armed revolutionaries seize power. Lenin does as his German paymasters expect of him and takes Russia out of the war. Lenin's declaration of an armistice was important in meeting popular expectation that the new regime would bring an end to the war. In July 1918, Tsar Nicholas, his wife and their children are executed. But Lenin and his communist revolutionaries will bring death and terror on a far greater scale even than the war. Civil war and communist purges will claim another 10 million Russian lives, snuffed out by the bullet, disease or starvation. The Russian people will soon learn that they have swapped one autocratic government for another, even more terrifying. Meanwhile, in autumn 1917, Lenin's armistice threatens to change the course of the entire war. With Russia out of the way, the Germans can focus on the Western Front. June 1917, French soldiers have risen up in mutiny. The British army will have to fight on alone. They plan to do it at Flanders, but first, they must capture the adjoining high ground at Messines Ridge. And they'll do it by stealth. The British prepare for their assault on Messines Ridge through a remarkable process of military engineering. Underneath the ridge, no less than 20 mine shafts are sunk, digging through the clay underneath, with the objective of planting a series of enormous high-explosive mines deep beneath the German trenches, ready to detonate them sky high when zero hour comes. 
The number of tunnelers digging beneath the trenches total 3,000. Many are experienced miners recruited from tin mines and collieries. The miners use a tunneling method they call clay kicking, using leg rather than arm power to get through heavy, wet clay. What I've got here is a mining tool used to dig under the enemy's position. This particular kind of shovel was used in clay kicking. Uh, this technique had been developed before the war in building sewers under Manchester and Liverpool. But what it meant was that the miner put himself on the cross, as they call it, a piece of timber with a cross piece, with his back on that at 45 degrees. And what the miner does is he puts both feet on the shovel and uses his strong thigh muscles in his back to dig forward silently and getting deep under the enemy. Tunnelling was going on 365 days of the year with people rotating underground in their shifts of eight hours or longer in absolutely appalling conditions. Always aware of the dangers of the enemy breaking in, a mine that would crush you or possibly poison gas. It's a ghastly, ghastly way to fight a war. By June the 7th, the miners have dug 21 tunnels, up to 30 metres below the German positions. The tunnels are packed with an incredible one million pounds of explosive. At 10 past three in the morning, the mines are detonated. It is still one of the largest non-nuclear explosions in history. The explosion is so deafeningly loud that it can be heard in London. For the Germans, it's little short of a nightmare. As many as 10,000 German soldiers are simply annihilated by this enormous eruption of high explosive. One of the largest mines creates a crater 40 feet deep and 250 feet in diameter. It can still be seen today. British and Anzac troops sweep over Messines Ridge, forcing the shocked Germans back to their third line of defence. The assault on Messines is one of the most successful operations of the First World War up to this point. It's a textbook example of how to carry out an assault on a difficult position using all the methods available to the British Army at this point. Messines is a complete military success. Finally, it looks as if the Allies have figured out how to break the Hindenburg Line. Emboldened by the victory, commander of the British Expeditionary Force, Field Marshal Douglas Haig, pushes on with his ambitious plan for the autumn. Haig's plan is to coordinate a breakthrough at Ypres with an amphibious landing on the Belgian coast. In short, this will create a strategic pincer movement that will allow Britain and its allies to capture Germany in the rear. Haig's first goal is to capture a village just five miles beyond the British lines. The name of the village is Passchendaele. Haig plans to use the same tactics that worked so well at Messine Ridge, but he has not accounted for one small detail. It's raining. In fact, it's the wettest Flanders summer for a generation. In the whole of August, the rain lets up for just three days. It rains almost constantly, and because of that, it floods, in part because the very, very careful system of drainage ditches built by the Belgians for years is destroyed by trampling feet and by shell fire and by mines. It turns into a quagmire, making advance almost impossible. The village of Passchendaele will forever be remembered for the slaughter that takes place there in 1917. battle begins to degenerate into a grim, attritional slog, fought in the most appalling conditions imaginable. It is clear that countless thousands of men are about to lose their lives. Wave after wave are sent over the top. Some are swallowed by the mud and drown. Many more are butchered as they stagger on, seen off by the machine guns. Still, Haig sends ever more men into the slaughter. 
Passchendaele is finally captured on the 6th of November. By then, British and Commonwealth casualties total 275,000. Germany's, 220,000. Almost half a million men. British soldiers are now calling their commander Butcher Haig. There is a new, dangerous mood in the ranks. Lloyd George would later come to regard Passchendaele as perhaps his worst mistake of the war, not least because the British never managed to punch through to the Channel ports. However, what it did manage to do was to draw away several German divisions, which meant that they couldn't then attack the seriously weakened French forces. The Hindenburg defensive line is holding, but a defensive line won't win Germany the war. Hindenburg and Ludendorff decide to go on the offensive, not on land, but at sea. The naval campaign that follows is widely thought to be one of the biggest blunders in military history. The Great War is bleeding the Imperial powers dry. Before it began, a massive dreadnought battleship had cost 1.9 million pounds to build. By the end of the war, the British Army is spending twice that every day just on ammunition. From less than 100 million in 1912, British defence spending in 1917 has exploded to almost 2 billion pounds. And Britain is also lending money to Russia, Italy and France to pay for their war efforts. But Britain is not just lending its allies its own money, it is borrowing it. And there is only one place on earth able to lend that kind of money, Wall Street. At the end of 1916, the investment bank JP Morgan was preparing to borrow another $1.5 billion on Britain's behalf to fund the war throughout 1917. But US President Woodrow Wilson forbids JP Morgan from issuing the bonds. He is turning off the money tap. The war must end. In January 1917, he calls on both sides to accept a peace without victory. For Wilson, this was America's moment to force the old imperial powers to make peace on American terms and to accept an American-run League of Nations as the ultimate arbiter in all future disputes. There is panic in London and Paris. The German ambassador in Washington urges Berlin to grab the opportunity for peace. But Hindenburg and Ludendorff want a total German victory. And they think they know how to secure it. They decide to resume unrestricted U-boat attacks in the Atlantic. They will cut off the Allies from their American supply lines. Hindenburg and Ludendorff did a careful calculation. They calculated that they could starve Britain in a five-month campaign. The German Chancellor warns that the plan to relaunch unrestricted submarine warfare is a high-stakes gamble that risks antagonizing America. Ordinary Americans were enraged when a U-boat sank the liner Usitania, killing 128 of their countrymen. But Hindenburg and Ludendorff do not fear the Americans. The US has a tiny army, just 128,000 men. The Imperial powers lose that many in a single battle. American battleships have never even fired a shot in anger. So on the 9th of January, 1917, the U-boat campaign begins. For many historians, it's come to be seen as the worst decision of the war. But for Germany, which was suffering terribly under the British blockade, it was hugely popular, giving the British back some of what they had experienced for the past years. Germany has 105 U-boats and its navy also commissions 10 giant U-cruisers, monster submarines which can double as cargo ships. 
In 1916, the first of the U-cruisers, the Deutschland, turned up in Baltimore Harbor, carrying a supply of dyes and pharmaceuticals. They were able to sell the supplies and return to Germany with hundreds of tons of valuable nickel, tin, and natural rubber. But as well as carrying cargo, the U-cruisers are terrifying weapons of war. Armed with 24 torpedoes and two powerful guns, they have a range two times that of ordinary U-boats. At first, the unrestricted U-boat campaign goes well. In April, Germany sends more than 860,000 tons of vital Allied supplies to the sea floor. The Allies are losing 13 merchant ships a day. But Britain soon responds to the threat. In May, British merchant vessels start travelling in convoys, protected by Royal Navy destroyers. By December, the weight of Allied shipping being sunk each month is halved to 400,000 tonnes. The destroyers, meanwhile, are refitted to deal with the subs. By 1917, the convoy system was better able to protect itself from the U-boat threat. Convoys were able to identify where those U-boats were and destroy them. British and American escorts also had much better, more sophisticated depth chargers and mines in order to destroy the U-boats before they could get too close. In 1917, the numbers of U-boats put out of action rise by two-thirds. In 1916, losses total 23. In 1917, 75. In just three months, German U-boats sink 500 merchant ships. But this causes outrage in America. President Wilson lifts the ban on lending to the Allies. He is still reluctant to take America into the war. But on March the 1st, that changes. Newspapers publish an intercepted telegram from Germany's Foreign Secretary, Arthur Zimmermann, to his ambassador in Mexico. In the telegram, Zimmermann makes Mexico an offer. Make war together, and Germany will generously support Mexico in its attempts to reconquer the lost territory of Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona. Rather than claiming that the telegram is a propaganda stunt to lure America into the war, Zimmermann admits it's genuine. If resuming the U-boat campaign was the worst decision of the war, then the Zimmerman telegram must run it pretty close. For the United States, this was the final straw. On the 6th of April, 1917, the US Congress votes to declare war on Germany. America's army is tiny, just 128,000 men. American General Pershing calls for a million men to be sent to Europe. But Americans have been reading about this gruesome imperialist war for years. Just 300,000 volunteer. So conscription is introduced. There are 65,000 conscientious objectors, including Quakers and Jehovah's Witnesses. 17 will be sentenced to death, though none will actually be executed. In the end, almost 3 million men are drafted. This new, fresh, well-supplied American army will arrive in Europe in 1918. For the Germans, time was running out. Their defensive victories in 1917 had come at a ruinous cost in lives and material. With the American army about to make its presence felt in the West, the Germans' only hope of victory lay in striking a knockout blow against the French and the British in 1918. By the end of 1917, three years of war has transformed the world. It has destroyed Imperial Russia and brought about communism. The old Habsburg Empire is on its knees. The French army has mutinied. Britain and Germany are bleeding each other to death. But now America has taken up arms. Growing in economic strength, can it impose peace on the squabbling, bloodthirsty imperial powers of the old world? <laughs>